So welcome everybody to tonight's talk, Christian Nationalism and anti globalization in the 2024 elections. Uh, my name is Chris Cruz. I'm a visiting professor here in the International Studies program and also teaching the freshman writing programs. Um, to give you a very short bit of background before joining Denison, I taught for a couple of years in the Comparative Religion and Humanities program at California State University Chico, and then at Grand Valley State University and the Area and Global Studies program. And a big part of my personal interest over the years, as well as my academic research, is around social movements and globalization and religion. And the last couple of years, especially looking at the increasing rise of religious globalization, religious globalism, political extremism coming out of both left and right social movements. So that's a bit of what's kind of informing um, this talk this evening. Just to kind of give you an idea of my plan for this evening, my goal is to try to give you as much information in as succinct and clear way as I can over the next hour, and then open it up for Q&A, questions, comments, criticisms, thoughts, and anything else that folks might have um, based on the talk. And I also want to say that I don't assume that anyone's coming into this conversation with a certain set of beliefs, so I'm trying to open up a conversation about what myself and many other scholars believe are um, important political issues, not only here in the United States, um, but around much of the world today. Um, so with that in mind, I want to kind of situate tonight's talk by thinking about where we are at in this moment, in this space and time here in Ohio. We are on like, the unsettled indigenous territories of, among other nations, Kahiri, Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, and Wyandotte. The indigenous nations that called this land home before Ohio was a state, and many who still live here and call this land home. Um, for those of you that do any work around indigenous studies, indigenous politics, you know there's a lot of problematic um, debates around land acknowledgments. Are they just performative? Do they do anything more politically important? My hope is that they do do something more politically important beyond just signaling that we are still on indigenous territory and these issues matter today. So what I want to try to do tonight is connect, like, what is this idea of Christian nationalism? How does it connect to a broad set of anti-globalization discourses? And how do those connect specifically to this year, which is a year where we're seeing the most number of elections in democracies around the world? So it's significant for a lot of different reasons. And right, we're approaching the end of our own presidential election cycle here in the United States. So I want to start off with a few just kind of background context. And so in my classes with students in international studies, we've been looking at the rise of political polarization, authoritarianism, threats to democracy. Freedom House, one of the sort of international institutions that looks at these issues and issues in the reports, just came out with their 2024 Freedom in the World report earlier this year. And I just want to highlight a couple of these findings based on 195 countries and 15 territories. Last year, 2023, was the 18th consecutive year in a row where we've seen a decline in democracies globally. And then so for scholars of democracy and political polarization and even civil wars that we've been talking about, these are worrying trends. 52 countries have suffered a decline since last year and only 21 have improved. So the, the balance of scales for democracy is not in democracy's favor at the moment. And that's being driven by problems with elections both doubts around elections and violence related to people actually being able to vote in elections. Driven in part by increasing armed conflicts and increasingly, let's say, authoritarian or dictatorial politics that are hostile to democracy, both as a theory and in practice. And, and that's included the denial of people's individual rights and civil liberties, both in countries and in territories, and so those of you following world politics, right, and we're seeing this play out in the West Bank and Gaza, but it's also an issue right in Jammu and Kashmir and in India and in a number of other places. And most importantly, and connected to kind of tonight's theme is pluralism is under attack in many places around the world as we see the rise of nationalist parties and politics, but a diverse, robust, pluralistic societies are still a counterbalance to some of these trends. So you can see, what that looks like right, over the last 18 years, this decline of global freedom, 
the blue side, countries that are improving, fewer and fewer and fewer. The red on the left, countries that are declining, there's more and more and more. And unfortunately, when we look at measures of democracy around the world today, what we see is that very few countries have citizens who live in what scholars who study democracy and democratization would call a full or robust democracies, and that includes our own country here in the United States. And so this is all a part of a, a broader trend that's been playing out, and those of you that have been following elections in the last year or two, particularly in Europe, but in many other parts of the world, right, what we've seen is far-right and nationalist parties gaining more political ground, getting more seats in parliaments and local government elections, and at the same time, the places where people say they have the most trust, the most faith in their government, that are places like Saudi Arabia, China, UAE, Singapore, India, Indonesia, though not what we would typically classify with the exception of India, right, as democracies and certainly not strong democracies. And so why is the decline in democracy also connected to a decline in trust in governments themselves? And we see this across the European Union if we look at recent statistics, and right? so the red bars are people that are dissatisfied with democracy in their own country. The blue is in the European Union more broadly. So across the EU, the average, 42% of the public are dissatisfied with their own government and with how the European Union is operating. Right? And we've seen that result play out in the elections in the last couple of months across many European countries with center-right and far-right parties gaining like, significant votes in some areas where historically they've been very weak. So just to kind of give you a bit of a conceptual framing for how I'm approaching this issue, uh, if we can think at the very broadest level, like, religion is kind of one domain of ideas and interactions and belief systems, and nationalism as another one. And those two, when they come together, then we get religious nationalism. But there's also right, secular forms of nationalism, and there are some forms people might say of kind of civic religions right, that don't look quite the same as the kind of religious nationalism we're talking about. So what does that look like in specific contexts? Right? Here in the United States, the kind of most visible dominant version is Christian nationalism. Right? In India, it's Hindutva, right? The Hindu kind of radical philosophy that only Hindus are true Hindus. We see this with the rise of Zionism in Israel, and particularly a religious inflection, right? So there's both a religious Zionism and a secular form of Zionism here with thinking about the religious form. And in Myanmar, Burma, a kind of radical Burmese politics there that has been hostile to Rohingya Muslims, Bengali migrants, and others. Or right, the politics and the shifts we've seen in Afghanistan and under the Taliban in their particular version of Islamic theocratic rule there. So we can kind of go from religion and nationalism to religious nationalism. We can drill down to what that looks like in individual countries. And then if we drill down further in the case of the United States, right, we can see kind of two big categories, right, a Protestant version of Christian nationalism and a Catholic version of Christian nationalism. They have a lot in common, but there's also some important differences when you kind of get into the nuances of theology, scripture, and historical partisan debates. But within both of those, Catholicism and Protestantism, right, there's a white Christian nationalist version of those. There's a black Christian nationalist version of those. And there's an increasing rate right, of Latino, Latino version of those. And that's both within the Protestant denominations and within the Catholic denominations. Right? So this whole world gets very messy very quickly. Right? And even within the kind of white Christian nationalism box there, right, that's predominantly a specific version of evangelical Christianity, right, which we'll get into a little bit more later. So if we think about kind of a broad timeline, Christian nationalism in some form, white Christian nationalism in some other forms, and I'll get into definitions of those in just a minute here, right, we can think about, so if you imagine this is this sort of a historical clock starting in the top left there, right, we can go back to anti-Jewish programs in Europe, right, led predominantly by Christian communities. We can think about the Crusades and the Holy War. Right? We can think about the genocide of indigenous peoples when conquistadors came over to the Americas. If we go forward just a little bit in time, right, we can think about the impacts with both West African and transatlantic slavery, both in the European context and in the North American context. At the Reconquista, where you're pushing out right, 
Muslims from Spain, you're pushing out Jews from Spain right, in the name of consolidating Christian political control there. Right, things like the witch trials in Europe and the United States. If we think more kind of specifically here in the US context, right, we have a long history of racial and ethnic and gender right, exclusions in law, both formal law and informal law and practices. Right, something about Jim Crow in the South. Right, the residential boarding schools where indigenous children were stolen from their homes. Right, and put through essentially state-run Christian organized re-education camps. And then moments like the Red Scare against the communism, right, which were deeply informed by a particular version of conservative Christian politics. And then today, kind of the moment we're in now, right, the kind of explosion of right-wing extremism, political violence, including groups like the Proud Boys, Boat Keepers, or 3% militias, and others. Things like the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, Right, or the idea that there's a deep state controlling everything in the world today from the shadows. Right? In some versions, that's right, the old, tired trope about like, this Jews controlling the world. In other cases, right, it's the swamp in Washington made up of uh, Satan worshiping Democrats who are sacrificing children and pedophilic rituals in order to harvest adrenochrome to extend their life. Right? This is where we get things like pizza game. Things like the big lie, right, that the 2020 election was stolen. And that Donald Trump should still be current president running, right? Not for a third term, although some people might want to see that, right? but for the end of his eight-year term. Increase in book bans and kind of more broadly, right, a culture war politics that we can trace back at least 100 years. So all this is kind of the background that what we're looking at tonight emerges out of, both in a European and an American context. So just over the last year or two, with one or two exceptions, it's been a huge flurry of research and publications and scholarship about Christian nationalism, both scholarly work, understanding it, examining it, trying to pick it apart, as well as advocates and promoters of different forms of Christian nationalism, putting their message out and trying to bring people into that kind of fold. And so what I want to do is look at how do people understand Christian nationalism? How is it being defined by different groups? Why do those definitions matter and what's at stake in some of those definitions? So Michelle Goldberg, who was one of the early scholars to kind of write about this in her book, Kingdom Coming, right, she described what it, when she wrote this as the Christian worldview. Right? And she said it was based on conviction that true Christianity must govern every aspect of public and private life, and that all, so right, government, science, history, culture, relationships, all need to be understood according to the dictates of scripture. And she called this, right, Christianity as a total ideology, a totalistic and political ideology, Christian nationalism. Right, so this is one of our early definitions that scholars give us. We move ahead to just the last couple of years. Um, scholars like Lindsay Whitehead and Samuel Carey in their book, Taking America Back for God, right, describe it as right, the explicit ideological content of Christian nationalism. So they're thinking about what is it that makes up this ideology? Historical identity, cultural preeminence, political influence right, are key pieces of that story. But just as importantly, they know, we'll look at how and why this matters, right, is the content that's often implicit in the arguments and practices and ideas. And as they know, right, this includes symbolic boundaries that conceptually blur and conflate religious identity. So assuming that Christianity, preferably Protestantism, is the true kind of Christian national identity. Race, right, assuming that we're white, nativity, that you're born in the United States. Citizenship, that you're an American citizen. And a specific political ideology, right, so socially and fiscally conservative. And they describe this as a cultural framework, right, or a, almost a worldview in which Christian nationalists read the world and make sense of the world, and then go and shape the world right, through that kind of image. Uh, a new group that just emerged in the last couple of years, it's called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. This comes out of some of the Baptists and other organizations that have felt like their religion, their position, their identity in the world is being framed exclusively in what they see right, as a dangerous version of Christianity, this sort of white Christian nationalism in particular. And so they define right in their work Christian nationalism as something that seeks to merge both Christian and American identities together, right? distorting in their mind right, both Christian faith and our right, constitutional democracy. And that happens because right, Christian nationalists demand Christianity be privileged by the state, 
Right? So all through all state policies. And right, implies that to be a true American, you need to also be a Christian. And right, as they argue, this often also overlaps and provides cover for various forms of both white supremacy and racial subjugation. And we'll look at some of the ways that that manifests and why that matters. So Amanda Tyler, whose book, um, How to End Christian Nationalism, just came out this past week, October 22nd. Um, she's one of the folks that helped found this Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Right? She defines it as a political ideology and a cultural framework. Right? It seeks to, again, it fuse with American and Christian cultural identity. Suggest that real Americans and Christians, and that the true Christians, in right, quotes, that hold a particular set of political beliefs. And right, equally important for the political project, right, they seek to create a society in which only a narrow subset right, of Americans are privileged in law and in societal practice. Just a few others to give us kind of a broad understanding of how scholars have been looking at these, and then we'll get into some more engaging content, not just text and slides. I promise. So Andrew Whitehead in his recent book, American Idolatry, he defines white Christian nationalism as a cultural framework. Again, we see a lot of scholars describing it as a cultural framework, as a political ideology. It idealizes and advocates for a fusion of a particular expression of Christianity with American civic life. And it holds that this particular version of Christianity should be the principal and undisputed cultural framework in the U.S. and government that should actively take a positive role in preserving that cultural framework. Another kind of overlapping set of scholars that have been working together, Phil Gorski and Samuel Perry, who are both the flag and the cross, they argue that white Christian nationalism is one of the oldest and most powerful currents in American society. Right? So they would point to that kind of slide with the clock on it and say, look, all of this in some ways ties back to this longer history of Christian nationalism and often a form of white Christian nationalism. The, the January 6, 2021 insurrection made visible for a lot of people in a way that perhaps they hadn't seen clearly or explicitly before. And they talk about this deep story about who America is and America's past. And so if you've ever read um, Patriots History of the United States, which is one of the books I use in my writing 101 class, that you get an understanding of, of a particular version of U.S. founding, the founders, who they were, and why that particular cultural narrative matters. So right, these are how scholars are thinking about these definitions. Now I want to look at how folks that self-identify as Christian nationalists, right, how they're defining their own movement, their own ideas. Right? So Stephen Wolf, um, who's written this case for Christian nationalism, probably the biggest, most extensive work so far from within the Christian nationalist community on this. That he defines it as a totality of national action, that consisting of civil laws and social customs, conducted by a Christian nation as a Christian nation, right, in order to procure for itself both earthly and heavenly good for Christ. Right? So it's both the politics of the temporal and the now, but it also seeks ultimately right at salvation and the saving of souls in the name of Jesus. Right? So the earthly political project ultimately seeks that higher that salvific function. Um, another set of important scholars, uh, sorry, important advocates that scholars have been looking at, Andrew Torba and Andrew Isker. Some of you may recognize the name Andrew Torba. He's the founder of Gab, one of the kind of more conservative online social media platforms that emerged when Twitter started cracking down and censoring more conservative political voices. So they argue that right, we seek to reestablish states that recognize Jesus Christ as king, the general Christian faith as the foundation of state government, and importantly, right, state laws that reflect in every way possible and reasonable Christian morality and charity. Christian nationalism, they argue, is more than a political movement. And I think this, this point is important. Right? Christian nationalism is also a social and economic movement, right? which gets to the kind of whole life perspective. And importantly, right, they argue Christian nationalism is spiritual, political, and a cultural movement. Right? So it encompasses every possible aspect of our lives, comprised of Christians that are working to build a Christian society grounded in a biblical worldview. Right? There are some of the recent um, conference of the Ogden Boys um, in Utah talked about this as building Christian boroughs and establishing Christian boroughs around the country. So some of the folks involved within the Christian nationalist movement came together in 2023 
partly in response to what they believed was negative press and a kind of demonization of Christian nationalism as only racist, only reactionary, only kind of negative. And they put together this statement on Christian nationalism in the gospel. It's a long document. It's worth reading if you have the time. But the key part of the opening says that Christian nationalism is a set of governing principles rooted in scripture's teaching that Christ ruled the supreme lord and king of all creation, was ordained civil magistrates, and so Jesus has given a heavenly power to the temporal um, civil authorities that delegated authority to be under him over the people, and so over all aspects of our lives, to order or ordain jurisdiction by punishing evil and promoting good. Right? So this is imposing a particular set of Christian morality and laws on the entire population for his own glory and the common good of the nation. So when we look at these different definitions, both sort of from within these traditions and scholars looking at these traditions, we see this tension right, between two almost in some ways irreconcilable visions. Right, so opponents would say Christian nationalism advances a kind of distorted version of U.S. religion and cultural history right, to promote a specific kind of conservative Christian ideology that they see right as a threat to democracy and particularly religious freedom, religious liberty, religious pluralism. Whereas supporters within the tradition right, would say, well, actually Christian nationalists were seeking to both reclaim and uphold right, these true Anglo-Protestant roots and the values and beliefs tied to right, an idea of Western civilization that the founders of the United States had and inscribed in all the original documents, Constitution, Bill of Rights, um, et cetera, and to subordinate right, all civil laws to biblical law and Christian morality. And so it's a very different vision of what the goal and the importance of that project is. For those of you that are interested in the study of religion, PRRI, Public Religion Research Institute, has put out um, three really good studies over the last year. Some just came out in the last month or two. So one looks at support for Christian nationalism in every state across the US. Another one that just came out this past month in October, because we're still in October, aren't we? Uh, looks at American threats to democracy, specifically connected to the elections. And then they also did one looking at the relationship between support for authoritarianism and Christian nationalism and what we can learn from this. So I want to look at a couple of the findings from these studies to help us understand what our experts are looking at these seeing right now in the U.S. kind of public. So an important methodological point here. Right? Christian nationalism is a definition that anybody can define in different ways, right, as we've seen. So when PRI does their public surveys, they ask these five questions, or these five statements, and they ask people to re respond to them. And then they combine those five kind of questions to create a Christian nationalist scale. So all of the kind of data they're using is based on how did people respond to these different questions. And right? so 21% of the people they've surveyed, right? so 22,465 people between March and December of last year, 21% agreed that God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of society. So that's kind of the low end of that scale. The bottom, the high end, it's like 39% of respondents agreed the U.S. law should be based on Christian values. So these are the kind of response questions that they're using to calculate like, what does Christian nationalism look like in the United States. And here's what they found based on that survey from March to December of last year. So they came up with four different categories. You've got adherents, which are kind of the strong, militant, vocal Christian nationalists. You've got the sympathizers, who agree with at least some of those five questions, but maybe not all five strongly. You've got the skeptics, who, you know, maybe they agree with one or two questions, but not all five. And you've got the rejectors, who are basically like, this is all nonsense, I don't agree with one another. And as we can see, 30% like of the United States is either adherents or sympathizers. So roughly one third of the United States holds some form of Christian nationalist views, some more strongly and some more weakly. Now the majority still, right, 67% are either skeptics or rejectors, but that tells us something, right, that a third of the U.S. population um, embraces and identifies with at least some of these Christian nationalist ideas. And if we look at where, right, where is the support spread across the country, some people have described it sort of as a, a horseshoe, Right, so you can almost imagine going up here in the Great Plains, dipping down to the Deep South, 
and then coming back up again near Pennsylvania. If you know much about cultural politics in the U.S., you can imagine why some of those areas might be more strongly aligned in terms of adherents and sympathizers. Now, if we look at how this translates across the party, um, the first part of this is useful, but the bottom two aren't as much because this was done before Biden dropped out and Kamala Harris became the VP slash presidential candidate, but it gives us some interesting data still. Right? When we look at in terms of how political parties are lining up with these questions, right, as we said, about 30% of Americans are either adherents or sympathizers, strongly right, in the Republican Party, but not entirely only Republicans, right? Significant number of independents, right? about 25%, and importantly, right, almost 16%, so almost 20% of Democrats also identifying with these Christian nationalist ideas. So we want to remind ourselves that um, even a conservative version of Christian nationalism doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be a Republican. Right? There are also many Democrats who hold these views as well. Now, if we kind of tease some of this data apart and think about, well, how does this play out within religious communities in the United States? And again, so thinking about that 30% at the top, all Americans, the pink and orange, that overwhelming the white evangelical Protestants is sort of the, the base of support for white Christian nationalism and Christian nationalism more broadly. 66% roughly is at the heart of that political voting block. But you'll also notice that Hispanic Protestants are a significant portion of that number. You'll also notice that black Protestants are an important part of that number, as are right, the Latter day Saints or Mormons. So it crosses within different families and denominations within Protestantism, and also, right, both white Catholics and Hispanic Catholics are not insignificant in number, right? It's only when you get within either non-Christian communities, Jewish communities, or the various unaffiliated, that you really start to see overwhelming rejection, right? people who are skeptics or particularly rejectors. Now, we think about how do these views fit into broader discussions about conservative politics, conspiratorial politics. That one of the things that PRI was asking folks is that this idea that there's a storm coming that's going to sweep away right, the corrupt political elites and bring the rightful rulers back into place. Right? This is a classic QAnon, uh, right, the Great Awakening, the storm um, kind of idea. And 25% of the public in the U.S. believes that. But within the adherence of the sympathizer, right, overwhelming support. Right? Similarly, when we ask people if they think things have gotten so off track that we may have to resort to political violence, right, who are the groups most likely to agree with that? And again, the adherence and the sympathizers. And this is exactly the trend that's worrying some scholars when they look at the connection between right, religious nationalism and more kind of militant forms of politics. Now, uh, Paolo Ramos, who uh, used to be a reporter with Vice, just published um, this new book called Defectors this past month, looking at the rise of the far right within the Hispanic and within Latino communities. And she talks about some of the trends that we can see here, and I'll unpack one or two of those specifically in a moment. But when we think about how do different denominations within Protestantism, within Catholicism, think about this question, the people that are most connected to this idea of a storm sweeping in and reorganizing the political landscape in the U.S., it's the black adherents and sympathizers within the religious traditions. But interestingly, when we ask folks about support for political violence and whether or not that may be necessary in order to save the country, it's actually the Hispanic adherents and sympathizers that have the strongest support for that idea. So even within different racial and ethnic communities in the United States, within the religious communities, these questions are pulling communities in different directions depending on what question is being asked and what they're responding to. And we can see this really clearly, right, in someone like Enrique Terrio, right, former leader of the Proud Boys, 2018, 2021. He's currently served with 22 years in jail for seditious conspiracy for organizing the Proud Boys to come to the January 6th insurrection. But importantly, right, he's also Afro-Cuban, he's Catholic, he used to run and organize Latinos for Trump, and he was radicalized at the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And so he speaks to, right, the black community through his Afro-Cuban background, the Latino community through his Afro-Cuban background, the Catholic and the Protestant communities, 
and the, the kind of white Christians who identify with the Proud Boys as a form of sort of militant uh, Western civilizational politics. So he's a really interesting character that crosses religious, racial, ethnic boundaries in a way that, that defies many of the stereotypes we have. Right? He has explicitly said that he sees the Proud Boys not as a, a racist, white nationalist organization, even though most scholars would disagree with him, but in his mind, it's about promoting Western chauvinism and a love for Western civilization, not necessarily a racialized version of that kind of narrative. So when all these different factors come together, right, we see things like Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president, the January 6th insurrection. Right? We see people at Stop the Steel rallies in the top center there. We see pictures right, of Jesus as a MAGA, MAGA right, diehard devotee, also January 6th. You see, right, the Christian flag, that white flag with the red cross and the blue background. You see the QAnon shaman in the bottom center, and right, the appeal to heaven flag, the old colonial flag going back to the times of George Washington, right, it's that white flag with the green pine tree. And then the bottom right, you see right, this COVID lockdown protest, but right, calling for the opening up of religious communities and other kinds of businesses. They all, all these different issues are kind of stitched together through these politics. Okay, so I want to walk us through what some of the folks in these communities are saying so you can hear them in their own words. I picked out three, right? Stephen Wolf, who's this author um, of the book, Case for Christian Nationalism. Um, he basically lived in the woods with his family, um, recently finished an MDiv degree, but he teaches online with the Kepler Online Classical Christian Education Institute. Pastor Joel Webin, who's a pastor of the Covenant Bible Church in Texas and also runs Right Response Ministries, and a number of kind of uh, Christian theology podcasts, and then Pastor Greg Locke from the Global Vision Bible Church. Each in their own way have been important both ambassadors and uh, sort of firebrands around these issues. So I want to start with Stephen Wolf, a case for Christian nationalism. And as he says there in that quote, his goal is to reinvigorate Christianity in the West, and to ask particularly white Christians in the evangelical community, right, what are you doing to kind of save your country? So this is what he had to say in a recent talk that took place with, uh, sponsored by the New Christian Press about creating Christian boroughs. Um, if you get a chance, the whole talk is quite fascinating, uh, but I want to look at one specific moment where he gives us an insight into how some of these dynamics come together in his own thinking and in his work. A nation of immigrants could be nothing less than a hodgepodge of groups from somewhere other than the soil they currently depend on. America, in this conception, is the universal place, a space for everyone, a no place. It is good only because everything about it is derivative. Nothing is from here except the Native Americans or, or American Indians, the only people group granted true rootedness with that, that term native or Latin for born um, or arisen. America is a land for people whose place lies on foreign shores, and to be truly American is to fight and even die to make this land a no place, a geographic space, an economic zone for any and all. There is no distinct American ethnicity, a distinct people and place, so we're told. America is the universal nation. It's rendered good not by settled hearts, nor by a culturally bound people, it requires that you affirm some universal abstract proposition, say that everyone gets to decide for himself the meaning of existence. But that's basically it. The deeper meaning of life, the sort of things that the heart owns, such as ethnic identity, cultural particularity, or a strong connection of people and place, must be supplied or rooted outside of America. Thus, the true Americans in new America are the hyphenated Americans, in a sense, these people are more complete human beings than the unhyphenated. Why? Because they have settled hearts with a people in a place, albeit a foreign place, while the unhyphenated have no place of their own. But we, the unhyphenated, those who trace our ancestry to Western Europe, whose roots extend beyond the Immigration Act of 1965 in Ellis Island, and which unite to this soil, we, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who founded, built, and died for and led this country for most of its history, we are not permitted in this new America to have a people or a place that is distinctly ours. There's no distant place that we call home. 
We have nowhere else to go. But this is our home. This is our native land. We are Native Americans, born of those who didn't immigrate, but who settled here. We are the sons and daughters of the people who settled this land. To describe America as a nation of immigrants, writes the great Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington, is to stretch a partial truth into a misleading falsehood and to ignore the central fact of America's beginning as a society of settlers. Yet the country that our ancestors built is no longer for us, for those whose hearts are settled here like us. It is not for those whose people are old stock Americans, whose people as a group were generated before, during, and soon after the American founding. We are not permitted to identify with this ancestry in any strong sense, at least. We cannot call ourselves heritage Americans. In a word, you cannot have, <clears throat> you cannot have a people like everyone else. And why is that? Because, because through them, you could lay claim to this country. Indeed, the whole point of the nation of immigrants trope is to render old stock American, the, the old stock American claim irrelevant and anti-American, and even to elevate the hyphenated over the unhyphenated as more American. And he goes on to say, and this is precisely why multiculturalism is a bad thing in America, it is a bad thing in Europe, um, and in other contexts. So a question for you to think about right, from what he says there is, do white folks in the US have no distinct cultural identity as he claims? And why would we agree or disagree with him? But there's also, like, going back to some of our scholars talking about the importance of implicit assumptions and encoded language, right, we can pull out some of that from Wolf's talk, right? So he acknowledges very clearly there that identity as a settler, right, that settler colonial framework, identifies himself right, and other white Christian nationalists like him as heritage Americans or old stock Americans, as quote, Native American even, right, as Anglo-Protestants, as unhyphenated Americans, and if we went a couple more minutes forward in that talk, as white Anglo-Saxon Protestants so on. Right? So these are the different ways that in his mind, white Christian nationalism inscribes the identity of the nation on itself, but as he argues, that very identity itself has become this kind of undermining characteristic of whites that all of these other hyphenated Americans have struggled to overcome right, in making this multicultural America. And in his mind, that itself right, is a problem. He's in some ways the most interesting of these scholars because he spent the most time unpacking all these. Um, but we would have to do a whole other lecture just to get into kind of the level of theology and debates he has. So I just want to give you a little taste of his arguments there. Second folks, uh, second guy I want to look at here, again, Pastor Joel Webin does this Theology Applied podcast. I uh, recently did a sh uh, show with Stephen Wolf after this conference we just watched the clip from where he explains why diversity is not our strength. And ironically, you can see the Springfield mural in the background there. And he often brings many other people onto the show. So the guy there in the... Um, Blue right here is Andrew Isker, one of the two authors of the case for Christian, of the Christian nationalism book that I showed earlier. So there's a lot of interconnection between these communities. So I want us to think about a couple of his arguments about how he sees and his vision for Christian nationalism. Interestingly, this first clip is from uh, Art Encounters, a conference that took place recently at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, where a bunch of evangelicals were gathering um, to talk about, as you can see there, racism, women's suffrage, eschatology, and the law of God. Um, but this specific clip is his response to how he understands Christian nationalism. Let's say you can wave your Christian nationalist wand. We wake up tomorrow in a Christian nation, a Christian nationalist nation as you're describing. All right? There's a lot of fears that people have. Here's one of them. Will women have the right to vote tomorrow if you wave that magic Christian wand? No. Okay, why not? That, and that, I want to get into why not. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, because if we had a Christian nation tomorrow and women did have the right to vote, we would not have a Christian nation within 50 years. <laughs> okay, ex so, elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, because the husband has been appointed by God as the head of his home mm. and no fault divorce and women's suffrage more than anything else, ultimately split the household. Mm. So we're not talking about women 
not having a say in society. We're talking about representative government. That's right. Right now, there are people in Williamson County, Texas, where I'm a resident, who represent me. No one gets to represent themselves mm. in every single scenario. That's right. We are all represented by somebody else, whether we like it or not. So why not have women and children represented by a man who loves them and is willing to die for them, mm. protects them, and provides for them? I would love to be represented by just one person in civil government <laughs> who has that level That's of commitment right. to That's me. Good. So it's not about, you know, men get to vote and women don't. And mm -hmm. like, no, it's about the household vote. The individual building block of society, according to the word of God, is not atomistic individuals. Mm. It is the molecule, not the atom, but the molecule of the family. Yeah. The family unit should not be separated. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Mm. I believe that women's suffrage was just one liberal attempt by people who hated Christ to, to sever the covenant bond between husband and wife. And that's what happened. We would not have one Democrat president. This is a statistic fact. We would not have one Democrat president in the last 50 years if women couldn't vote. So I don't want women to vote because I want strong marriages. Mm -hmm. I want cohesive households. I want representative government all the way down to the family. Mm. And I also want babies not murdered. Yeah. I don't want drag queen story hour. Mm. I don't want rainbow jihad. And none of that could happen if women couldn't vote. And so there's a lot obviously going on in that statement. Um, but... Right. Just to make this clear, this is not one cherry-picked clip of his. Um, this is something that he's returned to a number of different times. The reason why I have grown to despise democracy is um, because uh, it's not we the people. It's uh, we, we the some, uh, some people. And who are those people? Uh, Non-elected officials. Yeah. Uh, like what democracy, what, what it uh, gives, uh, lends its strength to is instead of having um, elected officials uh, that have power, is um, a raw universal, because that's what we have is a universal democracy. Um, everyone is allowed to vote, right? everyone. Uh, and just for the record, you know, yeah, I think the 19th Amendment should be repealed. I think that because, well, first and foremost, because I'm a Christian, um, you know, and that is, that is the Christian position. Oh my right. gosh, that, you're saying that, yes, that is the Christian position, uh, is that households should not be divided against one another, um, so it's not just elevating a male vote, um, but it's elevating the household vote. We're saying that um, that society, if you break it down to the basic building block, is not atomistic as individuals, but molecular being households. Uh, that the way that God sees humanity is He breaks them down to families, mm -hmm. um, and and so uh, that it's it's not just um, random individual atoms all you know bouncing around together and, and you know 350 million atoms bouncing together um in in one nation on one piece of land but it's um but it's families and so um by repealing the 19th amendment just for the record it's not just trying to take away a female vote but it's trying to say no there's a family vote right. um uh there's there's a household and it's like well where where do women get their voice uh well where women get their voice is um from their father from their husband. Uh, if they're not married, it's from their father. If they're uh, not married and their father's dead, it's from their brother, it's from their uncle, it's from, it's the men in their lives that love them. And so you can see the kind of way that gender politics is deeply connected, right, to a particular kind of Christian um, argument and theology here. But right, this is just one part of kind of a bigger picture that encompasses, right, this totalizing kind of political ideology that some of our scholars were talking about. So this is a little clip from them reacting to the Olympics and the kind of opening drag scene at that Olympics, as well as how the broader cultural politics that they see embedded in that moment, um, shaping U.S. broadly. Um, there are uh, there are two groups right now. There's um, wicked men. That's the GOP, and then there are uh, people who are exceedingly wicked and want to diddle kids. Right, and that's the Democrats. Those like that, it, it really is that simple. It's like, really, why are they doing this? And why are they, what's their end goal? Their end goal is to remove, in the same way they took uh, homosexuality and sodomy that used to be uh, viewed as a disorder, as right. a disorder. Not, and, and, and I'm not talking about 
four thousand years ago yeah. in the seventies, um, and they and they. Uh, remove that and rewrote the dictionary and redid the studies and all this kind of stuff, not because the science changed, uh, but because they lobbied and kept showing up at conventions and screaming at their opponents until they they did their bidding, until they just conceded. Um, their ultimate, if you think, what's their end goal? Their end goal is to do the same thing they did with yep. sodomy, to do that with pedophilia. Yep. Their end goal is to touch children. Yep. That's the goal. It really is that simple. The Democratic Party exists to make it legal to um, objectify children. And Joel, to bring it kind of full circle. The if... ones they don't kill. <laughs> kill half of them in the womb right. and then touch the others. Okay, last of our kind of Christian nationalist ambassadors, Pastor Greg Locke, two of his recent books here, This Means War and then his follow-up, um, Weapons of Our Warfare, so that um, passage in Ephesians about putting on the armor of God that was on the poster, is referenced throughout this whole book. And so think about how he's framing um, some of these issues. So he says, for example, in a section of the book titled When Right is Wrong, powers of this world have decided we are not allowed to offend anyone except God and his people. You can say anything you want about a Christian, anything. You can call us low down, hypocritical, yellow belly, homophobic, Islamophobic, xenophobic, sexist, racist, bigots, with zero evidence, and no one will blink an eye. But if you dare whisper to utter a disagreement with the LGBTQ crowd or the BLM slash Antifa crowd, you're marked with the scarlet letter for life. And then it continues a little bit further in another section entitled Case Study of the Insurrection Hoax. So he was at um, the January 6, 2021 insurrection. He was leading prayer circles outside. He took a large group of uh, sort of his church and others with him. And he says, as you should realize by now, there was no insurrection, just a sinister deception perpetuated by evil powers in high places and nothing more. Our crowd did nothing more than wave flags, shout patriotic chants, and pray in peaceful protests. And then a little bit later in that section, he says, in an age when godless globalist deceivers rule the media, and so this is the kind of anti-globalist conspiratorial language again, who control corrupt politicians and manipulate the minds of unbelievers all over the world, None of this should come as a surprise to any of us, not anymore. And so he bought fully into this kind of QAnon conspiratorial politics, right? In the, the next page after this passage, he explains how actually uh, the FBI and other undercover agencies arrived in um, unmarked white vans, came out dressed as Trump supporters, and then went into the Capitol and led the actual kind of violence. So the, the whole thing was right a staged um, plot from the beginning to demonize and trap. Um, people who weren't aware, right? So this is, if we were in his church on a Sunday, some of what we might hear uh, being said to us. I'm to the place right now, if you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. Bunch of devils. I'm sick of it. They want to talk about the insurrection. Mm. Let me tell you something. You ain't seen the insurrection yet. You keep on pushing our buttons, you low down, sorry compromisers. You God hating communist America. You'll find out what an insurrection is because we ain't playing your garbage. We ain't playing your mess. My Bible says that the church of the living God is an institution that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the Bible says that we'll take it by force. That's what the Bible says. Right, so all of these embody different spaces within this broader kind of Christian nationalist community and this Christian nationalist discourse. Many of them come together through big conservative religious gatherings. The most uh, visible and important one in the last couple of years has been this uh, tour called The Great Reawakening. It's both peddling the conspiracies about a great global reset and a sort of international globalist conspiracy, while also right, advocating both Christian nationalism and for right, individuals aligned with uh, Trump and the Republican Party and the specific version of Christian nationalism within right, the Republican Party. And on their site, you'll see right, uh, 
three screens worth of these icons, each of which leads you to more information about every various conspiracy theory you can think of, um, every reason why um, J.D. Vance is problematic, why Vivek Ramaswamy is problematic, why, you know, uh, there's a great COVID conspiracy led by Anthony Fauci uh, and on and, and on and on. But I want you to think about in this uh, final clip here, how some of these ideas are being fused together and the different religious communities that are being brought together in these spaces and how they're referring to where they are traveling in kind of the broader world and who their communities are. This is from an event just earlier about this year with Pastor Mark Burns. Well, hello, North Carolina! Listen, is there anybody here ready to re-elect the 47th president of these United States of America? I can't hear nobody, North Carolina. Are you ready to elect Donald J. Trump? Trump! I don't know about you, but is there anybody here in North Carolina ready to take this nation back by any means necessary? Say yeah, yeah, yeah. Show yeah. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not going to sit back and let Kamala Harris become the 47th president. Is there anybody standing with me who would do whatever it takes to make sure she's not the next president of the United States of Because we had war, somebody say yeah. yeah. Now listen, I didn't come here to North Carolina. For those who don't know, I'm from the great state of South Carolina. And North Carolina, you better make sure that North Carolina is country of Donald J. Because the reality of it is, this is a 911 cry of our nation. Do you believe that? This is not just about Donald Trump. You understand that, right? Because the reality of it is, this is about good versus evil. Our real enemy comes from the gates of hell. Are there any Jesus-loving, Holy Ghost-filled believers in the building tonight? I can't hear nobody. Are you in the building? Say yeah. Because this nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. This is why I love the president. And the president and I, we talk, and I love him so much. He sent me a text message a couple of days ago. I was just on a wonderful network called Right Side Broadcast. Anybody watch Right Side Broadcasting? And I, I, I'm on there, and, and, and I gave a, a contrast between he and 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 Kathleen Kamala Harris, are y'all gonna talk back to me here? Can 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 we pretend like we're in a black church for one moment and y'all shout back with me? Is there anybody in the building who's not afraid to open up your mouth for the United States of America? Okay, so you can see right the fact that he mentions you know I was just on this right response podcast which is podcast that Joel Webin hosts, Trump was sending text messages, and it gives us an inside perspective into how close the circles of political influence and religious influence are, just not only right within the kind of broader civil community, but also within kind of levels of political power. Okay, the last kind of piece I want to touch on here, and then I'll try to wrap this up so I don't keep folks extra long, it is the way that these movements, groups like the Proud Boys, Moms for Liberty, have been increasingly invading educational spaces, university spaces, school spaces, and right, pushing this uh, kind of Christian nationalist agenda that we've just been hearing about into school policies, both K through 12 and higher ed. 
So for example, Penn, a uh, group that looks at free speech, freedom uh, to write and to talk, just put out a recent report called America Censored Classrooms 2024. Right, what they found was that just this past year, we've had eight either bills or policies passed by states that impose some kind of what they call educational gag orders, restricting what we can talk about in classrooms, three targeting universities, three in K-12, and two that covered both of those areas. States have passed five higher ed bills trying to attack and undermine academic freedom, so that could be politicizing university governance processes, um, various DEI bans or training restrictions, um, to things like tenure restrictions, some of which we've seen play out here. Right, there are 47 educational gag orders and 10 other higher ed restrictions in 23 states between 2021 and 2024. And we see these play out right across different parts of the country. Some are laws, some are policies at the state level. Some have been proposed but weren't successful. Some have been passed but have been appealed. And we see right, there was a huge spike from 2021 through 2023 of trying to pass these bills both in the K-12 educational space um, as well as at colleges and universities. Those of you that follow Ohio politics, we've seen a number of these bills, right, Senate Bill 83, which is one that's still potentially going to come back up when the Ohio legislature comes back into session in a couple of weeks. There's been a drop off over the last year. Uh, most people suggest that's because a lot of these efforts have turned towards election organizing um, and away from some of the school stuff and legislatures being in recess over the summer. So there's a good chance we'll see this come back up again um, throughout the fall and spring once states come back into session. So they highlight kind of three key mechanisms that how these are taking place, right? The first one is censorship um, in disguise, as they call it. And so this is things like viewpoint diversity, calling for viewpoint diversity in classrooms. This is the language that SB 83 used, right, arguing that we shouldn't talk about certain divisive concepts. Um, a second one, right, are indirect forms of censorship. Things like DEI restrictions in schools, mandatory institutional neutrality bills, or things having to do with shared governance or other attacks right on higher education, things like tenure. And then the third one are what they call informal forms of censorship, which is where state legislators um, right, or political leaders or you know, leaders of colleges are just kind of making these decisions on their own, changing policy to preempt right, possible lawsuits or state bills forcing them to do things. So it's kind of voluntarily submitted into these kind of regimes. Again, as I said, these things play out in Ohio, things like SB 83, some of the bills that were in the state house got so much public pushback that the legislator instead put them into the state budget bill and passed them that way to kind of bypass the traditional committee hearing process and kind of state house processes. So um, as of this past year, we have a number of these new um, diversity or civic learning centers that have been set up, right? Intellectual diversity centers as the bill called them in Ohio. that are now publicly funded by the state for a number of years including our neighbor to the west at Ohio State University. So these are going to be independently run, independently funded, independently staffed and managed institutions, but supported with public tax dollars um, through the Ohio um, legislature. So what I want folks to think about is in all these different examples, it connects to what our authors before Philip Grossman and Sammy Perry called this deep story. The idea that America was founded as a Christian nation by white men who were, quote, right, traditional principles, and those principles are what make right, America, America. The United States is blessed by God, which is why it's been so successful. Right, the, as Reagan put it, the shining city on the hill, or as Winthrop said earlier, right, the city on the hill. And the nation has a special role to play in God's plan for humanity. And important, right, and we heard this in pretty much all of the speeches from the different pastors and advocates, that these blessings are threatened today in the United States and elsewhere by cultural degradation from what are seen as right, un-American influences, both from within, right, so cultural Marxism and others, um, as well as um, influences um, outside. So I want to stop here. We could spend a whole uh, three more hours going through examples and looking at the kind of rhetoric this looks like, um, but I think I've dropped enough information on folks so I'd like to at this point stop and open up the floor for questions, thoughts, reactions, and et cetera.